Thank you, Yubin. Thank you very much. Jonathan, I don't know why I look forward to meeting you, but I can tell you something, actually. What I've been told, and I've been uh, asked many times about having an accent. And I tell people that not because you speak with an accent does it mean that you think with an accent. So the brain, I was listening right here to Dr. Carmona. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's just truly inspiring. Just for me to listen there, to sit there and realize that is the power of this organ right here. It's called the brain that allows us to be, to say the things that we say and allow us to love each other and sometimes actually also allows us to hate each other. And recently I was doing an interview and they asked me, if you were to find a, something in the brain that you could change, what would that be? And I said very simply, if I can find that little piece in the brain that is responsible for hate that we have towards one another, I would love to be the one who obliterates that part of the brain. And I really do mean it. So I'm gonna spend the next about 20 minutes, if it's okay with you guys, and tell you a little bit actually, it's a very tough act to follow, Dr. Carmona, because not only is he an incredibly eloquent, charismatic, and superb speaker, but also his story, as I was talking to Dr. Pomeroy, is unbelievable. I mean, when you listen, the places, the place where he came from and where he is today, it makes you realize that every single one of us has hope of one day becoming something. For me, I always wanted to become Dr. Q. I'm still not there, I gotta tell you the truth, and I really do mean, and I'd say that with a, as humble as I can possibly be. I was here actually at UC Davis about three years ago giving one of the dean's lectures. I was so blessed to be invited by your wonderful dean to come in and meet many of you guys, and I was just so excited to meet not only a lot of the students in campus, but also to see the passion that places like UC Davis have for our future, the future of our country. When I was a little kid, I had a dream. I actually used to go to the roof of my small house out in the middle of the peninsula in Baja California and look at the stars. And I wonder if one day I was gonna become an astronaut. How little did I know that one day I was going to be exploring the universe. And I was gonna hold the universe with my hands almost every day that I am at Johns Hopkins and I hold it and that's the brain. And I get to see these cells migrating, which is what we do in my laboratory. They migrate with such beauty and I get to see the brain pulsating, dancing with the heart. Such a romantic and beautiful, mystical view of the human brain, and I get to see it every day. That little boy that came from Mexico when I was a teenager, that little boy that grew up in the middle of nowhere, also with parents that had no education like Dr. Carmona, but I was the same message that he gave you. My parents, my grandparents, played a critical role in my life. Today, I studied cancer, all righty? Cancer affects hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. Yubi actually showed this slide from Steve Jobs, obviously, who just died a couple of days ago from cancer. I specifically focus on brain cancer. We have about 40,000 patients in the United States battling brain cancer with their families on their side. Every year, we have about 3,000 new patients diagnosed with malignant cancer, the same type of cancer that took the life of Senator Kennedy, who you heard already the story with Dr. Carmona. And that is the cancer that I deal with and I battle it every single day inside of the operating room and outside of the operating room. And I gotta tell you, I am here this week 
I go to a tour, I go to uh, San Francisco, Berkeley, Stockton, back to San Francisco, and then I go back to Pennsylvania, flying all night. I go back Thursday and Friday, I do eight brain surgeries, eight brain tumors in those two days. And then Saturday, I have to run a half marathon. I gotta tell you, it's been already about over two decades since I did anything serious in exercise. And right now, I have a grade three tear right here in my gastrocnemius on the right side. So you can imagine the amount of pain that this can give anybody. But I gotta tell you, Friday morning before I came here, I did an interview with a lovely patient of mine. And I can tell you his name because he's already been in the media. His name is John Petrovic, 27 year old, a true hero. And it gives me hope that together, if we can cure brain cancer, imagine all the other types of cancers of our society that we can also cure. I did an interview with him. They cut us out there in Hartford County, beautiful Maryland, running on the side of, the, uh, of, the, of the, some, uh, some of the most beautiful trails in Pennsylvania and uh, in Maryland. And they interview him first. And I was in the background with this reporter, 27. I did his first awake craniotomy three years ago. He was training for the marathon. Suddenly, he felt a little bit of numbness in his hand, and next thing he knows, he is going through convulsions in the middle of the streets of Baltimore, Maryland. Just about three months before the Ma Baltimore Marathon, he ended up in my hospital, ended up referred to me, we transferred him from another hospital, and I found out that he had a tumor right here on the left side, right next to the motor area of the brain and very close to speech. I met him, he was in his second year of law school. We ended up doing brain surgery. He ended up having a glioblastoma, which is the same type of tumor that Senator Kennedy had. We cleaned up, he woke up weak in the contralateral side, the other side, his arm and leg. Not only that, not only did he had to undergo the surgical treatment, but after that, he actually ended up undergoing radiation and chemotherapy. I gotta tell you, one of my patients sent me a letter once saying, you know Dr. Quinones, I'm very upset with you because you scared me to death about brain surgery, but it turns out that the brain surgery was the easy part. It's what came next that I had absolutely no control of. When I met you, I had control of who my surgeon was going to be. After that, I had no control as to what type of radiation and what type of chemotherapy, and the amount, the toll that he took on me was incredible. John Petrovic felt exactly the same way. He ended up going through six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, another couple of rounds of chemotherapy, and he was about six weeks before the marathon. And he woke up one day, got out of his house, and he couldn't even walk a block. And right there and then, he made a decision that he was gonna run the Baltimore Marathon just a few months later, about two months later. But not only that, he was also going to raise funds to battle brain cancer. That was three years ago. He did it, he invited me to be part of his team, and I said, John, I do a lot of things, but running has been you know, a few decades since I done that. So, he ended up raising funds for my lab, he kept bugging me and bugging me, and then this year, this summer, in July, as he's preparing for this marathon that is gonna be this next week, a Saturday from today, he has another seizure, and guess what? The tumor is back. Thank you, thank you. The tumor is back, so I had to take him back the first week of July, immediately after uh, the, uh, the 4th of July. We went back, the same thing happened again, the same tumor, which now was much bigger, but that didn't stop him. He said, I'm still gonna run the marathon, and right now his blood count is very low, and yesterday he and I were, did a seven mile run, and I gotta tell you, he kicked my butt. <laughs> but I gave him my best, and I said, all right. So, I mean, the pain is there, but I felt okay. I think that if we just pace ourselves, we're gonna get through these 13 miles, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. So. Imagine that, that's what I get to do every single day. But I tell you, life for me wasn't like that all the time. And I like to spend just a couple of minutes just to tell you a little bit about my journey 
to uh, actual medical school. And I think that watch is incorrect. Is that? Well, I, I could, we're, we're right. We're right on time. I'm going to stop around 9.45, if you don't mind. So I recently, after many years of thinking about my life and my journey, decided to release a book where I tell the story, my story, and the story of my mentors the way I have seen it. A lot of people have come and interviewed me, and they've written about myself, but I wanted to have an opportunity to see and tell the world the way I see the world and the lessons that I have learned. So I went on and published this book. It's called Becoming Dr. Q. And I was thinking about what can I tell you that you don't already know? What can I tell you differently than what Dr. Carmona already told you? The stories are very similar. There is hope inside of all of us. And I can assure you that I am too not the smartest guy in my class of medical school, certainly at UC Berkeley. It was a very competitive before that. At San Joaquin Delta College, there were a lot of kids that were much brighter than I was. But what defined me was exactly that, my ability to work 24, 24 hours, seven days a week. So let me tell you the experience that I had my very first day and uh, when I went to um, actually an anatomy laboratory that was put together by um, the Stanford Medical Students actually that, around that time. This is 1990 actually. And I'm going to read you a passage of this story right here. And um, the story is nothing else but the fact that I wasn't all, always meant to be a brain surgeon, to be honest with you. As a matter of fact, when I was at UC Berkeley, I had no idea what I was going to do. I thought I was going to go to law school. At one point, I thought I was going to go to, uh, you know, become an industrial psychologist. You know, I was thinking about it. You know, I noticed that when I go to the grocery store, I really can identify where people look at things. And that's, what, that's one of the jobs that many industrial, industrial psychologists do. Actually, when you go to the grocery store, pay attention. They put things, they sell you things the way your brain works. So I was interested in the brain. But let me tell you, I got to tell you a story. This is the summer of 1993, as I am uh, coming back from Cornell, and I had to spend the summer over there studying in the Department of Psychiatrists. And the story is as follows. That summer, when I arrived in Boston and stepped outside of the train station, I remember being 11 years old and dreaming of going far away. I was sure I had arrived at the elusive place. Meeting Dr. Poussant was amazing, another amazing person, just like Dr. Carmona, who's a very, very well-renowned professor of psychiatry at Harvard. Handsome and vibrant. He had the ability to make everyday conversations sound like oratory. And he also made me feel instantly at home. Since I hadn't applied to medical school yet, I had no reason to read anything into his Spartan words to me. I believe we may be seeing more of you, young men. I certainly hope so. And his voice was really, truly deep. The meeting fired me up, boosting my desire to aim as high as possible. What did Dr. Carmona say? Aim high. Back in California, I said as much when I ran into Mike from community college, this is San Joaquin Delta College, the guy who wouldn't introduce Anna to me way back when. Remind you, Anna is my wife now. Maybe his reaction was sour grapes, but he couldn't have been more discouraging about my prospects for getting into a medical school like Harvard or Stanford or UC Davis. It was next to impossible, he said, for someone like me to get accepted. Does that remind some of your stories? When I shrugged, saying that I wait to see how I did on the MCATs, the grueling test required for medical school applications, which was the way it was a hard test. I, I can tell you from my own experience. He laughed, warning me, you're wasting your time. I later learned that he had been trying to get into medical school and had failed to pass the test the first time around. Much as I tried to ignore his skepticism, my doubts returned when I sat down in the fall of 1993 to fill out the medical school applications, who was I kidding, I asked myself. Just as I started to reconsider my prospects, the phone rang. It was Hugo Mora. Hugo, are you here? Is Hugo here? I see you, Hugo. Right there. Can you, lift, can you raise your hand? And you're filming something. Right? We're going to say hi to each other because Hugo is all over this book for many reasons. Who didn't even bother to announce himself as he asked, you need a right to Stanford for Dia de los Muertos? 
Hugo didn't explain that he, that the event at Stanford was a conference for minority pre-med students, much like what you have, but much smaller than this. This is unbelievable what you guys have here today. Um, it, uh, for medical school and obtaining financial assistance, uh, nor that the main event would be an anonymous seminar in which he would dissect cadavers. Once I heard Dia de los Muertos, all I needed was the date and time, and I was on my way. Day of the Day celebrations connected me to my roots, to the days when our Aztec ancestors celebrated the last corn harvest before winter arrived. The ritual merged this ancient celebration with the Catholic religious holidays of All Saints Day and All Souls Day at the beginning of November. My associations with the traditional celebration have remained happy through the years. The music, the parades, the custom in mast, and the altars adorned with miracles and special items belonging to the deceased to ensure that their souls would enjoy coming back for a visit. And also, tons of candy. The Stanford student group that sponsored the conference skillfully connected the holiday cultural traditions with the work of those who study medicine, especially during the anatomy and dissection demonstration. Even though, here it goes, even though I felt queasy and may have looked pale in the photo that Ugo took that made the book that day, this being my first encounter with a cadaver, I was inspired by the lesson that we need to respect what the dead can teach us and to honor those people who depart from this world and leave us their bodies so we can learn more. The event also helped me realize that when dealing intimately with the dead as physicians do, it is healthy now and then to put on the mask and dance in the face of death, defying and mocking it with celebration, passion, and joy. When Ugo took that picture and eventually sent it to me, he said, I never thought that you were going to become a surgeon, let alone a brain surgeon, because he, he thought that I was going to pass out. All right, and you can actually see that picture right there in the book. But this is what I do every single day. I celebrate life. I celebrate with my patients and their families the fact that we all have a journey. And one of the greatest challenges that we face every day is to realize that inside every single one of you guys, there is a beautiful story to be told. And the greatest challenge is many times, how do you tell that story? How do you tell that story in your personal essay right before you apply to medical school? I can tell you in my case, it was actually Ugo who went and spent hours and hours in Cafe Strata right there at UC Berkeley helping me to get through this. So you have to look. You have to search for mentorship. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of people here today who want to work with you, who want to help you achieve your dreams. My message is very simple. Don't follow someone else's path. Instead, as my grandfather used to tell me, be a trailblazer and find your own way. But be careful. Sometimes you can see the path that others have taken and the mistakes that they themselves have made. And you can learn from those mistakes. I'm not saying that you're not going to make mistakes. As a matter of fact, it is human nature. I always take pride in saying that most of us can make one mistake. But making the same mistake twice is really significant and it's almost like not paying attention to what you're doing. Many of us realize that it's not just the education that we obtain, which, by the way, Aristotle said over a thousand years ago that education is the best provision for old age. So, but it's not just about the education. My grandfather used to tell me, a fool with a good tool is still a fool. It's not the tool that matters. It's not the education that you obtain. It's what you do with that education. It's the social responsibility that we have. In my case, I have chosen to fight brain cancer. And I fight it inside of the operating room and outside of the operating room. And I wish I had more time 
to spend in many of the other diseases that affect our country. I have decided to pursue my dreams, thinking that if we can cure that type of cancer, imagine the doors that it could potentially open to cure many other diseases of our society. Look at yourself in the mirror every single day, and you realize that there is power within you. There is hope inside you, and you have to fight every single day to make sure that those dreams that you have don't escape you. And people sometimes will tell you, you can't do it. And you just got to get up in the morning a little bit earlier than everybody else, and you got to go to bed just a little bit later than everybody else, and I can assure you, 5, 10, 50, 20 years from now, you will be the Carmonas of the future. That is a promise. Determination, you will need. Resilience, you will find in your heart. Excitement for life will give you the fuel to keep moving forward. Ability will come only with training and education. Mentorship is something that I hope you will give to others. You will be taking care of me in about 15 or 20 years, and it is my responsibility to make sure that you know that your dreams are within your reach. I thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is an incredible and very inspiring moment for me, certainly to be in front of all of you guys, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day and learn lots. Thank you.